you guys get so quiet before we start? Shh, be very, very quiet. What am I, hunting rabbits, right, or something? So, hey, pray for our service this morning. We've had technical difficulties like you wouldn't believe, and it's not actually surprising given the text we're going to be in this morning. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 13, talking a lot about Satan again, and he doesn't like it when we talk about him at church, at least not the way we're going to talk about him today, because this text exposes a lot of what he has planned for the end times. So I think we've got everything working. I think everybody at home can hear us now, and uh, it sounds like everybody here can hear us. So um, I just want to reiterate a couple of the things that Susie said. Um, Lots going on. We're starting to get some more stuff back on the calendar, which we're super excited about. Again, if you haven't been baptized um, on the first Sunday of... Oh, kids, I'm being told, send the kids out. (laughs) Send the kids out. For the love of God, send the children out. We love you guys, and we'll see you afterward. So so if you haven't been baptized, uh, you're supposed to be baptized. It's one of the very few things that Jesus told us we are supposed to do is baptize people. So if you've yet to be baptized, um, what are you waiting for? This is a great opportunity. If you perhaps were baptized years and years ago and you weren't exactly sure what you were doing and you want to do it again, that's fine too. Baptism is simply an outward statement of something that's happened to you on the inside. So you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you've made that personal commitment and now you simply want to tell the world about that. Baptism doesn't save us. We don't do it to get saved. We do it because we've already been saved. So um, if you're interested in that, please see one of the pastors or come talk with one of the prayer counselors after service and we'll get your name on the list. There's no six-week class to go to and you're not signing up for anything here at the church. Um, We just want to bless you and baptize you uh, and just help you before your church family to make that uh, commitment to the Lord. Uh, And then as well, some fun things that are on the horizon as we head into the fall Um, Some small groups that we're working on right now that we're excited about, those usually kick off kind of about mid-September once everybody gets back to school and back into the regular routine of life. Um, But the announcement that I really want to mention this morning is, again, just about serving. So there's plenty that goes on uh, at a church to make church happen. And so if you're interested in that, whether it's helping with the technical team or uh, ministering back in the back with the kids Uh, either as a teacher or simply as a helper. Um, If, bless your heart, you want to work with the youth, we have opportunities for that too, the junior high and the high schoolers. Um, I heard somebody laugh out there. They got that. Yeah. Um, Bless their hearts, right? Um, So anyway, whatever you want to do, we want to help you do it. Ushering, setting up, you know, greeting, all of these things. So uh, I will say, in addition to the fact that we need people to do those things, I can't think of any better way to really get plugged in to the life of the church and to meet people at the church. You know, my favorite time of church, well, I shouldn't say this, but one of my favorite times of church is that hour before church when people are here and people are setting up and we're praying for the service and it's just a neat time. So if you're looking for a way to be more plugged in, uh, that's a great way to do it. So I don't know why I took all the time with that, especially since I have way too many pages. So buckle in this morning. It's going to be a thick one, but I think it's going to be a good one. I think that uh, we're going to come away from this edified and hopefully encouraged uh, as we look at these last days of the tribulation. So Revelation chapter 13, let's pray and just ask the Lord to not only bless our text today, but certainly as well, just that he would have his gracious hand over all of the technical details. So Father, we are so thankful to be here together as a church family, Lord, just united uh, as brothers and sisters Uh, in your son Jesus. And so um, we're excited, Lord, to go to your word. We thank you for the privilege of studying it each week, Lord. We pray as every week as we do that you would be our teacher today, Lord. We pray that that teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit would be manifest here this morning, Lord. We do pray that you would give us a smooth service technically and uh, bless all those folks that are joining us remotely today. 
And so we just ask your blessing, Lord, on everything that goes on here, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Revelation 13. We are still stopped here, right? Kind of roughly in the middle of the book, in the middle of the tribulation, right? So we're about three and a half years into that seven-year period of Daniel's 70th week. So we have the first two of three sets of God's judgment that we've already seen kind of poured out, right? They are now behind us. And now we're in this parenthetical passage, right? Chapters 10 through 14. And they are placed right here in the middle of the book, at the middle of the tribulation, as the Lord kind of takes this opportunity to give us some additional background information to all of these different things that we see happening during that seven-year period. You remember that last week in chapter 12, we started what was really kind of a section within a section. Chapters 12 and 13 together introduce us, we said, to some of the key characters that we're going to come across in this end time drama. And we saw some of them last time. Remember the woman, Israel, her male child, Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, the coming king of the world. We met also Michael, the archangel. And we also then were given some detail on a character that we certainly already know, right? The dragon, Satan. We saw in, in detail how Lucifer, that, that shining star of heaven, became Satan, the adversary or the accuser, and how he really began his mission to thwart not just the purposes of God, but ultimately the people of God as well. And now as we move this morning right into chapter 13, we're going to continue kind of along those lines. Having looked at Satan, this morning we're going to look at what we might call the two members, the two remaining members of kind of that unholy trinity, right? This chapter is going to introduce us to what the Bible calls two beasts. And we're going to see that they are two beasts who do the bidding of the dragon during these last days. We're going to see the antichrist, the beast from the sea. We're also going to see the false prophet who is the beast from the land. And we're going to see that this term beast doesn't necessarily mean that these are wild animals. Instead, they are men, but they appear and they certainly act more like animals than like humans. And we're going to see that starting right here. We're going to look at the beast from the sea, the Antichrist. Verse 1 of Revelation chapter 13 says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea. So again, John in these visions that he's having in heaven, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So here, again, we're introduced to someone who's going to be a most important player in this end times, described by John here as this beast coming out of the sea. Now this is the Antichrist, right? We've seen him before. It's this coming world political ruler. And interestingly, we may have mentioned this last time in chapter 6, but interestingly, remember, the Antichrist is never actually called the Antichrist by John here in the book of Revelation. We get that term from John's letters to the churches. And if, in fact, we look at this character, other biblical writers give him a number of other names and titles and descriptions. He's the little horn of the vision in Daniel chapter 7. He's the king of fierce countenance in Daniel chapter 8. He's the prince that shall come in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 11 calls him the willful king. Jesus calls him the one who comes in his own name, right, whom Israel will receive as Messiah after their rejection of him as Messiah. And Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 refers to the Antichrist as the son of perdition, the man of sin, and the lawless one. So that's quite a resume when we look at it, right? We're going to call him the Antichrist. 
because that's really the term that seems to have stuck and that's really captured the mind and captured the imaginations of so much of the world. Now, what's really unfortunate is that most people today know nothing about him except maybe what they've seen right back in the mid-70s, right, in a movie like The Omen. I think there was a remake of it even more recently. But the picture that the scriptures paint are very different than the idea of some sort of strange devilish, devilish child, you know, and the, the chaos that's caused all around him. But the scriptures paint a picture of a very powerful man, this world ruler who's going to emerge. Now, in the scriptures... The sea, S-E-A, right, sometimes symbolizes humanity as a whole. You know, we would talk about the sea of humanity. And so that's the idea here, right, that the Antichrist is going to rise up from the sea. More specifically, when we get into chapter 17 of this very book, the sea specifically is used to describe the Gentile nations, right? The non-Jewish nations of the world. Revelation chapter 17, verse 15 says that the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And what we see is that it's from one of them that Satan is going to bring forth this super leader. Now keep this in mind. This doesn't necessarily mean that the Antichrist will be a Gentile. And as a matter of fact, I believe that it's much more likely that he will actually be probably a European-born Jew. At least somehow Jewish by heritage because the Jews would only embrace another Jew as their long-awaited Messiah. Specifically, in Daniel chapter 11, it tells us, speaking of this same person, that he shall regard neither the God of his fathers. Right Now, the Old Testament very often uses that phrase, the God of your fathers, to refer to the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. So we could conclude that this ruler's ancestry, right, both scripturally and just logically, is, has to be Jewish in some way. And then only in that way would he have these kind of dual credentials that he will need to rule over and lure the entire world right under his authority, both Jew and Gentile. Now, interestingly, in that very same passage in Daniel chapter 11, it goes on to say that he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Now, the fact that this says he has no regard for the desire of women, some believe actually implies that the Antichrist will probably be a homosexual. Now, admittedly, this would absolutely add to his list of worldly credentials, right? It would increase the audience who would certainly embrace and accept him. Now, even if this isn't the case, alternatively, Many simply suggest that he, this, what this means is that he rejects the messianic hope of Israel, right? His people by heritage. See, it was the desire of every Jewish woman that she might be the mother of the coming Messiah, the, the nation's savior and king. So two possible interpretations there. Either one of them fits and as we know, we will watch this from the balcony and we'll find out which one was right. So at any rate, he's a figure that emerges on this world political scene. He rises up from the sea of humanity. He'll be very quickly embraced. And up to this point, at this midpoint of the tribulation, remember we went through this in, in chapter 6. The Antichrist has become the head of this 10-nation European League. Right, very likely he'll come up from within the struggling European Union. He'll probably help to stabilize that sometimes kind of tottering political scene in Europe. But now, now he's about to embark kind of on a new phase of his career as he actually becomes this dictator under the control of Satan. Remember in chapter 6 we saw that he's going to begin his career as a peacemaker. 
He will probably even be the one to finally settle that Arab-Israeli problem, making a covenant with the Jews, remember this, to kind of protect them politically for seven years. And that the protection would very probably permit the rebuilding of their temple and the reinstituting of their religious rituals. But remember then three and a half years into that seven year covenant right here in the middle of that seven year period, the time that we're looking at now in Revelation 10 through 14, remember the Antichrist will break that covenant, he'll stop all of the ceremonies and he will set himself up as God in the temple and demand to be worshiped. Now, the symbolic sort of divinely given description that we're gonna see John gives us of the beast here, I think it really gives us some insight into both who and what this man will become at this point in his career. From heaven's perspective, he's no longer even seen as a man. Not even to be compared with that divine image, but instead now he's simply seen as some sort of a wild animal completely under the control of Satan. He is a man, but he will be energized from hell. You know, just in the very same way that Jesus is God in the flesh, the beast at this point will be Satan in a human body. We see it's at the end of verse 2 there. It says that it was the dragon who gave him his power and his throne and his authority. Now, it's interesting to consider, and we don't know because the scriptures don't tell us. And if you know, you can tell me afterward. But we don't actually know whether this man knows he's the Antichrist before he becomes the Antichrist. I think it's much more likely that he is simply a very talented very ambitious, kind of an up-and-coming leader, already probably active on the political landscape somewhere in the world today. And I believe that this man is the man who just may make the deal with the devil that Jesus refused when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. You remember in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan, it says that he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory, and he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And I believe that this man will take the bait and ultimately end up being possessed, not just by a demon, but being possessed by Satan himself. So he is going to be pure, pure evil. Now, understand, he's going to be pure evil for all seven years of this tribulation period, but he will be so seductively evil during that first three and a half years. He is going to look like the greatest thing that has ever happened to the world. And yet he will ultimately lead so many in the world right into destruction, just like Satan himself. Notice that the vision here from heaven's perspective, the vision of the Antichrist, doesn't it look a lot like the vision we were given of Satan himself just back in chapter 12? It talks about the seven heads and the ten horns and on his head these ten crowns. And remember talking last heads and horns and crowns in the scriptures are very often pictures of power and of authority. And so again, we see visually that this beast will have all of the same power and authority over all the world that the dragon does, because it'll all be given by the dragon to him. What is significant, when we compare this description of him to Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, it specifically tells us that the seven heads are seven mountains. And we mentioned very briefly last time that, of course, Rome is the city that was known to have been built on seven hills. It's often called the city of seven hills. So many believe that this is a direct reference to that very powerful city and believe that the government of the Antichrist will initially be based there in Rome and be kind of a continuation, if you will, of a revived Roman Empire. Now, as we read through these verses, right, notice that the, this beast that John sees has very key characteristics 
that remind us precisely of the four beasts that Daniel saw back in his vision in Daniel chapter 7. From Daniel chapter 7, we know that these beasts represent these four great world-dominating empires that were to come. The lion, representative of Babylon. The bear, Medo-Persia. The leopard, of course, representing Greece. And finally, in Daniel's vision, he sees this terrible beast, which is Rome. And so the idea here in this text is that the coming of the kingdom of the Antichrist will be in a lot of ways just like a continuation of all of these wicked kingdoms combined. All united now, all of their evil to really dominate the world. So far, all we know is that this Antichrist has control of this 10 nation confederation of Europe, which in and of itself is quite a lot, right? You think of all of the incredible wealth and all of the military might, all of the resources economically, you know, monetarily from all of those separate countries combined. So here's the question. How is it that he goes from being the head of Europe to now gaining control of the entire planet? And as we go on to the next verse, we're going to see that there's a very specific event which will occur, which will really sort of catapult him, if you will. It's going to help him to clench the minds and the hearts of the rest of the world. Look in verse 3. John says that I saw one of the heads, right, of the beast, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So you think about this world ruler, right? And at, at some point in this kind of meteoric rise to power, this final world ruler, it says, is going to suffer a wound which normally would have been fatal, and yet he will survive, right? Miraculously, because we see he's healed by Satan. Now, what many prophecy students suggest is that at some point the beast, right, the Antichrist, is going to be assassinated. There will be an assassination attempt made on his life. If you just look down in verse 14 of this chapter, it talks about the beast who was wounded by the sword. So he didn't just trip and fall, right, and mortally wound himself. He was wounded by the sword. So there's very likely an, an assassination attempt to kill him as he's ascending to power here. This wonderful ruler who's bringing solutions to all of the world's major problems economically and politically and socially. And there's this assassination attempt that will look like it was very successful until it's as if he were raised from the dead. Now, interesting, back in chapter 11 and later in chapter 17, we're told two different times that this beast ascends out of the pit. And some suggest that this is a clear you know, reference to some sort of a resurrection that he will go through at this point. Now, resurrection of a dead person, right, the actual giving of life would seem to go kind of beyond what Satan has power to do. And yet, the healing of a wound, which appeared to be fatal, would absolutely be possible for Satan. And so, again, deception, right? So this may be the better explanation here. I want to read you one thing. It's very fascinating. In the Old Testament book of Zechariah, we get a little bit more insight into all of this. In Zechariah chapter 11... The Lord says this, For indeed I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off. So this is a prophecy about the, the terrible shepherd, right? The Antichrist. He'll not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those who are broken, nor feed those that still stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against him and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally 
blinded. Now this seems like kind of an odd level of detail, right? Right here in the middle of one of the minor prophets until we realize that it points prophetically right to this coming event in the life of this coming world ruler who is the worthless shepherd. So it seems that as a result of this assassination attempt, he's going to probably lose the use of his right arm, also of his right eye, and yet he will survive, right? And it will be miraculous. And what better way to garner the support of the world community than to see that he was so obviously saved through some sort of a supernatural and clearly miraculous deliverance, right? It's going to cause the world to wonder. It's going to cause them to collectively embrace him as their ruler. Not only will they follow him, but at this point, the whole world is now going to give Satan exactly what it is that he has always been craving. Look at verse 4. It says, so they worshipped the dragon and gave authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? So it's, it is this supernatural recovery that they witness that's going to make him the object of the worship of the world. And yet unknowingly, notice what the Holy Spirit is telling us here. The world is going to be worshipping the beast, but unknowingly they will be worshipping Satan himself. They might not know that they're bowing down to Satan, but this is Satan worship nonetheless. And even today, of course, you know, the actual outright worship of Satan, it is becoming more and more popular each year, but it is still only a fraction of the people who actually, you know, would, would declare that that's what they're actually doing. And this is all part of Satan's deception, isn't it? Because most people are expecting Satan to appear as some sort of ugly, horrifying sort of a monster. But in fact, it's the opposite, isn't it? Paul warned us in the letter to the Corinthians, the second one, he said that Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Remember, when the Antichrist first appears, it will be as a savior, right? He will be the answer to all of the world's problems. And yet what we're going to see now is that once he has the affections, once he has the allegiance at this midpoint of the tribulation, watch the way that his approach is going to change radically. In verse 5 and 6, it says that he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So remember, for the first three and a half years, he sounded like Mr. Nice Guy, right, in all of this. But when all of this happens, he gains power over the world, and now he doesn't have to hide what he's really all about anymore. And people are going to see his true colors start to come out. What we're going to learn in just a few chapters in chapter 17 is that up until this point, as he has been the head of this federation of Europe, he's been working in very close cooperation with this developing one world church, right? The harlot. And he's going to pretend to be obedient to this apostate religious system. He's going to, in fact, use it to kind of further his own conquests. But it's here in the middle of the tribulation, right, as these verses describe that he kind of accomplishes this dominion over the world. At this point, he is going to absolutely destroy that apostate religious system, right? That's when he sets himself up both as the ruler and as the god of this world. Remember, it has always been Satan's end game that he himself would receive the worship that's due God alone. Remember in Isaiah 14, he said, I will make myself like the most high. 
And so this will be Satan's final form of really counterfeit religion. He would now sort of assume that place of God the Father. This beast, this world ruler, would now assume the role of the king of kings as a substitute for the rightful king, Jesus Christ. And you'll see he'll start to blaspheme anything that has to do with God, everything that has to do with heaven. He'll start to persecute the believing Jewish remnant on earth. And it's right at this point, like we saw back in chapter 11, that he will kill the two witnesses. And all of this as a part of this assumption of this role of worldwide dictator, which we learn here is going to be allowed to continue for 42 months, which is how long? Three and a half years. So it's that second half of the seven-year period, right? This is the point when the tribulation, the great tribulation, pardon me, actually begins, right? This is when all hell literally breaks loose on earth, right? The Antichrist will be able to do now what so many other men have tried to do throughout history. He will control the entire world. World. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says that it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So just like the prediction made in Daniel's vision in chapter 7, the Antichrist will devour the whole earth, right? Trampling and crushing it. Every tribe and tongue and nation, he's going to control them all, demand their worship. And for the most part, the world will worship him. Paul warns us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that God's going to allow this strong delusion to come upon all of those people who have rejected the truth of Jesus Christ. And so they will be open to really embrace that lie of the Antichrist. So the world will worship him. The saints will oppose him. And what we see here, though, is that he's going to be allowed by the Lord even to overcome them. So here's the question. Who are these saints that are going to be overcome by the beast? Well, it certainly isn't the church. It can't be the church, right? Because Jesus promised in Matthew 16 that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And of course, we know the church isn't even here on the earth at this point. So the saints that he's allowed to overcome are God's people who have come to faith in Christ during the tribulation, right? after the church has been raptured. And because of their faith now, the Antichrist is going to single them out for persecution. And though he may be allowed to overcome them physically, we see that he can't overcome their faith in Jesus because their names appear in the book of life of the Lamb. And they will be delivered, right? Many of them will be delivered through death. But they're ultimately going to be delivered from the condemnation that's about to come. Now, I don't know of any way to make this sound better than it's going to be for the people who, you know, who put their faith in Christ and are alive during the tribulation. This is going to be a terrible time of terrible pain and terrible torment for all of God's people. You don't want to be here during that time. And because of that, look what God's Spirit does next. In verses 9 and 10, we're offered this great encouragement. Verse 9, it says that if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity, and he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So doesn't this sound strangely familiar like the exhortations we saw to the seven churches as we went through chapters two and three? Right? So right in the middle of this passage, there's an invitation and an exhortation to anyone, it says, who will listen. And of course, what's interesting and it's significant 
is that each of the seven times we heard this phrase as we were going through those letters to the churches, it was just a little different, wasn't it? Because each of those times, it said that he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here, he doesn't say that. He doesn't mention the churches at all. Again, an evidence of the fact that the church has been removed from the earth during this time. But it's a warning to all of those who have faith in Jesus, who are still on the earth at this time, it's a warning to listen to what he's saying about what's happening, right? It's a great reminder, I think, that in every age and in every place, God always speaks to those who are ready to hear. And here, for those who are prepared to hear, right, for those who are living through this hell on earth and who are being persecuted and punished and even perishing here at the hands of this wicked, satanically empowered, world-ruling dictator, right? All of the forces he has at his disposal to all of those saints who are suffering so terribly, here is an encouragement that there will ultimately be justice. That this, that, you know, this one who is behind all of this persecution and who's causing all of this trouble, the one that's leading so many to their destruction in the lake of fire for eternity, that he will surely end up right there himself. And this is one of those recurring messages we see throughout the book of Revelation, right? We get to know what the end of the story is in order as an assurance for us during those times of trial and of tribulation, right? It's an assurance that we know that our God will be victorious. And we know that all of those things that are wrong will someday be made right. Right? Again, just this hope, this reminder, right, if you will, that life is short, God is still in control, and we are going to heaven. And can I just say this? If you are sitting here this morning and you still have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you are watching us this morning and you're in that same boat, let me just say as nicely as I can, you need to do that. Because only he can save you from the deception that's already on this world right now. Only he can save you from this greater deception that is coming and will be so clearly pitch black dark spiritually that will come upon this world. He's the only one who can save you from what's coming in order that you don't have to go through this terrible time of tribulation. This is real, folks. This is really coming to a world near you. What we are reading about here is nothing less than history in advance. Every single word, every single line is going to be written into the history books of this world. And we need to be on the right side of these things as it continues to unfold and get worse and worse. If you haven't made that decision, today is the day to do it. And as we close today, there will be people up here who would love to pray with you and talk with you and help you understand how you can take that step. So we have this, I wrote here that it's a fast developing picture, but really nothing's happening fast this morning, is it? But we have this picture developing, right, of this unholy trinity. We saw Satan in chapter 12, We've seen the Antichrist now in the first 10 verses of this chapter. And now we come to the beast from the land, the false prophet in verses 11 through 18. John says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, in chapter 16, chapter 19, chapter 20, we are told specifically that the beast from the earth is called the false prophet. And so here now we have our, our unholy trinity completed, right? Satan counterfeiting the father, 
the Antichrist as this poor imitation of the Son and the Savior, and now the false prophet counterfeits the Holy Spirit. I should say the unholy spirit, right? One of the main ministries of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus and to lead people to trust in, to worship him and bring glory through that to the Father. The false prophet is going to be this personage, if you will, who's going to point people to the Antichrist and ultimately compel them to worship him and therefore be worshiping Satan. The, the, the false prophet is kind of Satan's primary mechanism to bring in this false religion, right, instead of true faith in Christ. And in order to fully accomplish this, notice that Satan equips this false prophet, it says there, with horns like a lamb. And I think that that just speaks of peace and friendliness. Because notice, unlike the descriptions of the other two parts of this satanic trinity, notice there are no crowns, there's no authority on these horns, right? Because all authority, it doesn't belong to the false prophet, all authority rests with Satan and the Antichrist. I think instead that the suggestion here of this wording, the two horns like a lamb, simply suggests that the false prophet is going to appear gentle and harmless and approachable like a lamb. And yet the words that come out of his mouth are going to be as damaging and as destructive as a dragon, right? They're going to be full of fire and they are going to be stinking, if you will, of sulfur and they are going to bring death to multitudes. Remember that we can never ever make an, actu an, an accurate spiritual assessment of any individual just on the basis of what they appear to be on the outside. Because they may look harmless and humble and sweet and inviting like a lamb. But the real question is not what they look like, but what are they saying? What are they saying about God? What are they saying about Jesus? What are they saying about salvation and about heaven and about hell? So I don't care how charismatic or eloquent a person is. I don't care how many robes that they wear. I don't care how expensive their suit is. I don't care how fancy the, the big building is in which they operate. If they look like one thing and yet what they're saying is all wrong biblically, then something is very, very wrong here. So we need to listen to what people say and we judge that by the word of God, just like who? Just like the Bereans did. Remember, the Bereans took the teaching of the great apostle Paul himself, and it says that they were more fair-minded, which remember we said meant noble-minded. They were more noble-minded in that they received the word with all readiness, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So don't be misled because some personality has a huge following or a very seemingly successful ministry or they have a book deal or they have a podcast or even their own TV talk show. The question is, what are they saying? Because you can see today, it's all about cult of personality, isn't it? And the world and our culture is increasingly ripe for just this kind of alluring deception that's going to be manifest here by the false prophet. Not only in what he says, but look at the next few verses and what he's allowed to do as well. Verse 13 says, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. 
He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, as I was reading this, I had to kind of laugh to myself. Sometimes I, I crack myself up, right? Somebody has to laugh, right? Isn't it amazing that what's going to happen is exactly what Jesus promised was going to happen. Remember in Matthew 24, he said that false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Then he says, see, I have told you beforehand. So here this false prophet to lure people away from the truth and to draw them to worship the beast, right, the Antichrist, the second beast, it says he's actually going to duplicate some of the miracles that the two witnesses did. What did the two witnesses do? They were calling fire down from heaven. So what does the, the false prophet do? He's enabled to call fire down from heaven. Remember, don't overlook the fact that, well, of course, God can do supernatural things, but Satan, within certain limitations, the Bible shows that he can also do supernatural things. And he can manifest himself and his demons in supernatural ways. And he's going to use that power to the full in this situation to induce people to worship this substitute Christ. Look at verse 14. It says he's going to deceive those who dwell on the earth. And then it gets interesting, right? Because it says in verse 14 also that it's going to be the false prophet who orders this image of the Antichrist to be made to be set up at this midway point in this seven-year period, where? Right there in the restored Jewish temple at Jerusalem. Now, I think, timing-wise, it's very possible that the setting up of this image is done in celebration of his miraculous recovery as a way to honor this almost martyr, right, for world peace and for progress. And we read these verses and we get the sense that for the citizens of the world, this is going to be a time of great celebration. But from the perspective of heaven, this is the abomination of desolation. Right? It's that event where the temple is desecrated, of which Daniel and Paul and Jesus himself all, all spoke, right? And this, understand, this isn't just going to be an image or an idol. This image is somehow going to come to life, right? It's going to move and it's going to speak. And, and I want us to take just a moment, imagine this from John's perspective as he sees this and as he tries to record this. John, of course, would have been so very, very familiar with images and with idols. Remember, they were being worshipped all throughout the Roman Empire at this time. You could go to any city that you wanted to and find idols and find many, many more idols than you could count in either direction. So John is more than familiar with idolatry and with images that were carved out of stone or carved out of wood and all of that. He's used to that. But here he sees an image or an idol that is alive. Right? Now that freaks him out, right? This thing is alive. And again, like we said before, it doesn't appear that Satan has the, the ability to actually give life. So we can only assume somehow that what the false prophet is able to do is to give this image the impression of life. The impression that it's breathing or that it's speaking, maybe mechanically, right? Like an automaton, is that the word, right? Or maybe it's a combination of some sort of natural and supernatural powers. And understand as you try to picture this, we are not talking about the characters at the country jamboree. Right? We're not talking about that old, those broke down things at Chuck E. Cheese. We're not even talking about good old Mr. Lincoln, right, in the Hall of Presidents. It used to be, 15 years ago, that he was our best illustration of what this thing might be like. We'd say, oh yeah, there's going to be this image and it's going to breathe. Think of Mr. Lincoln in the Hall of Presidents. But who even knows now 
what in the world this might be. It could be virtual reality or holograms or robotics or cloning even or some twisted combination of all of these things. Whatever it is, it is apparently going to be quite convincing to people because it's going to cause them to want to fall down and worship the beast. And they better do it, right? They better worship the image because what does it say at the end of the verse? That as many who would not worship the image, they were to be killed. Now, talk about an effective way to force compliance, right, and to ensure obedience. And yet that presents them with one big problem. So we have a big problem between this order to put them to death and the carrying out of being able to do that. How could you find any people who refused to bow down and worship? How would you possibly identify them? So a surefire solution, look in verse 16. It says that he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So to enforce control over this order to worship Right? It's actually going to be the false prophet who's going to require everyone to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead. And without this evidence, without the evidence of their allegiance to the Antichrist, they won't be able to buy or sell anything. Now, how better to ensure 100% compliance to this governmental mandate Right, to an, than, to, than to limit an individual's access to the very necessities that are necessary for life itself. Could you even imagine something like that happening? Where you have to show a mark to get into a certain place or to buy a certain thing. I'm going to stop myself. The Bible says that in the multitude of words that sin is not lacking, so I'm going to stop so just because they needed to get out there and buy necessities, what this is going to do is it is absolutely going to force each person in the entire world to decide whether or not they will worship the beast and comply with this requirement and to willingly identify themselves with the Antichrist by taking this mark or they're going to suffer, suffer the consequence. Now doesn't this sound just like from chapter 7 the 144,000 that received the father's mark on their foreheads. And so the followers of the beast are going to have his mark either on their foreheads, it says, or their right hand. Now, there has been no shortage of speculation throughout all of the centuries as to what this mark of the beast might finally be. And the truth is today, in our world of technology, we now have such a host of options, right? It used to be that we would get all worked up. Remember back in, the, in 1970 when they introduced the magnetic stripe on the back of a credit card, right? Or the hologram that started to come in the 80s, right? They'd see the hologram on the front and people were very worried about all the information that could be embedded in those things. And now, of course, we have these microchips, right? That are smaller than a single grain of rice, which can be loaded up with way more personal information than we could keep in a huge file cabinet at our home, right? Social security numbers and addresses and work history, criminal history, right? Medical history, all of your financial information, right? And then, of course, these little microchips could be, and they are being, injected almost imperceptibly under the skin. And just think of the convenience Think about it. There's no more fumbling with a wallet. Right now you've got doors that are going to open for you automatically as you approach them. You've got computers that are going to be you know, opening instantly without even a touch, let alone having to enter some kind of a password. Right now that alone, the promise of no more passwords to remember, right? that's reason enough just to get one of these chips, right? 
think of the increased safety. Think of the, the, the safety and security that this kind of technology is going to provide. You'll have real-time tracking of anyone that you love. Right? Not only the elderly, right, if, if they suffer maybe from Alzheimer's or dementia, but you could put one of these in one of your children and always know where they are 24 hours a day. Yet you've got real-time monitoring of all of your own health vitals. So that if you're having a health crisis, they can dispatch emergency services to you even before you know that you need it. They show up and say, sir, you're having a heart attack. Oh, okay, well, thanks for coming. These, these kinds of devices are very soon going to be far less of a novelty and they're going to be absolute necessities. And they're going to be accepted by the masses in the name of public safety and in the name of public security and probably even in the name of public health. After all, we have got to know in real time if there's a walking threat around us to our own personal health and potentially even be able to contain that threat or maybe neutralize that threat. I'll tell you that we used to have to search for articles about this kind of emerging technology if we wanted to use it as a sermon illustration, but now they're just right common in our news feed, whatever we're reading. And my point here is that the false prophet is not going to need to create this technology. He's not even going to need to get the population to embrace or accept the technology because that will have already happened. It's already happening. By that point, people won't be able to live without this type of technology metaphorically. So all the false prophet has to do is suddenly tie this technology now to the worship of the Antichrist, and then people will not be able to live without this technology literally. Okay, but here's what we need to know, and here's what we as Christians need to remember, I think as we move closer and closer toward this point, is that none of this technology that we have available in our world today None of it is the mark of the beast. Now, it may well be some of the nascent technology that's going to be used in the mark, but it is not the mark. No one is going to take the mark of the beast by accident. So, if you happen, for whatever reason, to have a chip put in your body, not that I'm recommending it, but if you do, that isn't the mark of the beast. When a person takes the mark of the beast during the Great Tribulation, they will know exactly what they're doing. Okay, it says in, in the next chapter that there will be an angel who will go throughout the entire earth and warn everyone against taking the mark. In Revelation 14, 9, it says that if anyone worships the beast, this is the angel proclaiming, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. How's that for clarity? There will be no mistake, right? When a person takes the mark of the beast during the Great Tribulation, it will be a very purposeful, individual, internal identification with the Antichrist. It'll be tied directly to the worship of the Antichrist. People will be saying, I worship him, I want to worship him. I will never change my mind about worshiping him and they'll receive this mark. So the next time you're leaving Disneyland and they try to put that re-entry stamp on your right hand, I'm not even sure why we still need those re-entry stamps, right? Anyway, if they try to put that thing on your right hand, you know that it's not the mark, right? <laughs> You don't need to worry when you're at the dentist, right? If they put you out or you're in the hospital, don't worry that they're implanting something in you without you knowing it. It's not the mark. You don't need to worry that they have hidden the mark in some sort of vaccine that might be available to you today. 
Don't worry about any of that. Now, you may want to worry about the fact that you're being forced to take it, but again, that's a different, that's a different discussion. What all of this does is that it tells us that we should be able to rejoice because this technology is right here. This technology is in place for this mark. It's not just sort of science fiction, but as I said before, this is reality coming to a world near you. And what's amazing is that the Bible wrote about all of it 2,000 years ago. Think about throughout all the generations of believers that have come before us, they could only wonder and they could only speculate about how this could possibly happen. We are reading about it and we are living with it each and every day, right? Look up for your redemption draws nigh. Finally, last verse. We have this description of the mark and now this text concludes with a warning about the beast himself. It says in verse 18 that here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. 666 and it's 1120. Let's do this fast. Like few other verses in the Bible, this verse has created so much confusion. Right? So much speculation. People have tried to use this verse as a kind of a formula to identify the Antichrist. Because in both ancient Hebrew as well as ancient Greek, each letter has a corresponding numerical value. So for us, A would be 1 and B would be 2, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it's possible to assign kind of a numerical equivalent to the name of an individual. There was uh, some graffiti that was discovered in the ruins of Pompeii, and it reads, I love her whose number is 545. So this was a real thing, right? So given this, there have been so many attempts to tie this number to an individual historically. The problem with this is, if you juggle and struggle long enough with letters and, and names, you could make just about any name fit. Just in very recent history, Ronald Wilson Reagan, right? each of his names has six letters, right? Franklin Delano Roosevelt, William Jefferson Clinton, Prince Charles of Wales, each of their names adds up to 666. John F. Kennedy, well, he received 666 electoral votes, so maybe it's him. The list goes on and on, and the point is that it is probably a pointless exercise, right, to try to figure this out. Now, what we do know is that six in the scriptures is usually considered to be the number of man, right? Man was created on the sixth day. We're given six days in the week to do our work, just in the same way that the number seven typically signifies completion or per perfection, usually speaking of God. The number six is just one shy of that. Right, it signifies that there's some sort of imperfection there. More specifically, the, the imperfection of the sin that we as men struggles with, and, and women, if I'm being inclusive. So it seems like this number, the Antichrist 666, some believe that it represents the very highest that a man could become apart from or instead of God. Right, so this is kind of Satan's Superman, right? Seven is the number of perfection, and that's a number that Satan will never reach. Now, what's interesting scripturally is that the only other time that we come across the number 666 in the Bible specifically is in 1 Kings chapter 10, 14, where it talks about the yearly wages that King Solomon Received. It says that the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. So in this light, some have suggested that the Antichrist, like King Solomon, may have been a good man who simply became corrupted by all of the riches that the world has to offer. 
don't mishear me. This isn't to say that Solomon was the Antichrist, right? It's also not to say that the Antichrist is going to be some sort of a strange reincarnation of Solomon. But again, it may simply indicate that the Antichrist might not be someone who was purely evil from the beginning, but just like King Solomon, someone who started off well and finished very badly, deceived himself by Satan, deceived by all of the alluring things that the world has to offer. Now, we are closing at this point. I want to quickly say this. We might not be able to identify the Antichrist personally. But John, in his letters to the churches, gives us a, a warning and a, a method of identifying what he calls the spirit of the Antichrist. He says, if you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Then in uh, 1 John 4, he says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Remember, Antichrist, right, it means against Christ, but it can also just mean in place of Christ or instead of Christ. So I think that what John is saying here in its simplest form is that in the spirit of Antichrist, which he says is alive already in the world today, it's anything that takes our focus or takes our eyes off of Jesus, right? And this could be all the pseudo-Christian cults who deny the deity of Jesus. It could be full-blown false religious systems, right, that deny that Jesus is the only way to the Father. But it also can be these very subtle attempts of Satan in each and every one of our own lives just to shift our focus from Jesus onto the things of the world. In that sense, the spirit of Antichrist is indeed alive more and more and active every day. Now, I don't suspect this morning that any of us here are involved in pseudo-Christian cults or, or false religious systems. But for each one of us, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is it in our lives that might be shifting our focus from Jesus? I don't know everyone here, but for some it might be drugs, it might be alcohol, it could be sex, right? It could be music or entertainment or movies or any kind of media or, you know, fashion or your career. It could be relationships, it could be, you know, that you're steeped in, in self-help and worldly psychology. If it's none of those things for you, right? If any of us were able to escape that list, it might simply be the tyranny of the urgent, right? Just that busyness that we simply accept as part of modern life, right? That shifts our focus off of Jesus. It places it on the cares and concerns of this world, and it chokes out the word of God, just like we saw in the parable of the seeds. Don't be fooled. So much of what's happening in this world and in our culture is being orchestrated and planned and executed by the God of this age, Satan. And that's not a conspiracy theory, folks. It's a biblical reality. And all of it, all of it that we see is in preparation for this very time in history that we are looking at right now. It's Satan's all-out last-ditch attempt to receive that worship and that admiration. Most people alive today in this world are being prepared for exactly this time, and they have no idea. And I think that's why it says here in verse 18, right? We who, as it says, 
are looking for wisdom, we who have understanding, right? We can calculate this number of the beast because it's the number of a man. A number perhaps of a man who started well and finished badly because his focus was taken off of the Lord. So simply let's be on guard against anything in our own lives that replaces or just simply shifts our focus off of Jesus. If we're as close as the signs to the end would seem to indicate that we are, then as we said before, the Antichrist is probably alive. He's probably already active on the planet today, probably in European politics. But instead of looking for the Antichrist, you know what I'm going to say next, right? We should be looking for Jesus Christ. Amen? Father, thank you so much today for your word. And um, Father, I thank you for the patience of everyone, Lord. I pray that by the power of your spirit, Lord, that those things which you've shared with us today that you want to remain would remain Lord, I pray that anything that you desire to fall away would fall away. Lord, we pray ultimately that you'd be the one. Lord, give us ears to hear what it is that your spirit is saying to each of us as a church. Lord, certainly we know as a church there's work to be done uh, collectively, Lord, as your bride. Uh, we also know, Lord, there's work to be done individually. I pray that you'd identify those areas in each of our lives that might be kind of antichrist even this morning. Help us, Lord, to seek you about those things and to, um, to allow you to work in us, Lord, to keep our focus where it needs to be. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.